It's the Garage to Orloff Show. It's uh, about 5 in the morning, Sunday morning, uh, March 20th. Um, furiously packing here, uh, getting ready for a move that's coming up very soon. So <clears throat> I thought I'd bring you along with me. And then you can be there for the unpacking also once we get to our destination. So, uh, I'm going to be packing some stuff up in this tub. Some of the, uh, some of the Batman stuff. So, let's see what we can do here. Alright, I'll put the sturdier stuff down at the bottom. Um, I had a feather brush and it disappeared so I guess I'll dust this once I get up to our destination uh, this Batmobile um, that's cool it's got a Batman on the bottom it's like a I would say this is a 1940s style Batmobile from the comics right from the same series. It's Corgi. It's 1940 Batmobile. It's got a scuff on one finger. Um, wouldn't it be cool if they made a Batman movie? with Batmobiles like this. I haven't seen the new Batman movie yet. Um, and uh, by the time we get to our destination, uh, it may be gone out of theaters for all I know. And, uh, pretty soon it's going to be, I think, they only have a 45 day window now between when a movie's released and when it comes out on uh, HBO Max or whatever. So. That may be. It might still be playing at the theater in the ta little town we're going to. There's a little town theater called the Princess Theater, and it's like pretty much from the silent movie era. It's a tiny little theater, but they were playing Batman there. Um, this is one of those Funko Pops, but I thought it was cool enough to add. Um, yes, indeed. Um, wait, I need to add that real heavy one. Oh, shoot. I'll put that under the box. Put this over here. Right now. I can't even get there from here. Man. Uh, soon things will be better because we're, we're going to have a lot more square footage in the new place and... You won't hear as much cursing and uh, frustration as I just try to move several inches. And you have to twist your feet in weird directions at weird angles just to move a few inches. Okay. Let's put this little tiny... Uh, A little metal cat woman. She's very uh, heavy. So let's get her in there. Another metal up. Uh, Batman Returns type of cat woman. Here's another Batmobile up here. 
This is a 70s era Batmobile that is, it's uh, missing the little, uh, what do you call it, little bubble, bubble canopy, whatever. Uh, this is from, uh, it's a Mego one. I guess maybe for the, when Mego started making the smaller figures, in, uh, when Mego was in its death throes, I guess that's probably from that era. Okay. Here's some more cat women. I like to put them next to the Batmobiles like they're admiring the cars. This one is especially good for that because it looks like she's looking down into the car like she's at a used car dealership. This, that's the official action figure that came out in, was it 91 or 90? No, it couldn't have been 90. It must have been about 91, 92 when this, the sequel to the 89 Batman came out. I don't know how excited I am about Michael Keaton coming back as Batman because it's in a um, movie with the Flash played by that horrible guy. Um, oh, here's the uh, Batman the Animated Series uh, Catwoman. Which is arguably, I uh, no, there's no argument, the best adaptation of Batman into another medium other than comics. There is no argument about that. Unless you're arguing with an idiot or a simpleton. Uh, who would want to do that? Um, okay, what is this fucking thing? Whoops. Okay. Is this a model kit? I don't know if I assembled this one. No, there's no glue spots. Oh shit, it's missing a wheel. Where's the wheel? Oh, there's the wheel. It broke. So if, as long as I display this properly, um, this might have been a model kit, but with metal parts. I don't remember. Damn, I gotta dust this. Um, This one's solid. This was not a model kit. This is uh, all in one piece. And has a lot of detail. Um, this one was made by uh, somebody. Somebody made it. Chinese slave labor, I'm sure. <coughs> no, I don't. It's just the dust getting me. But if you want to put on a mask while you watch this video just to make sure you don't catch something, you're welcome to. You put on two masks and it'll be even safer. Because coughing can be uh, that can be transmitted over YouTube because that's science. I heard from Dr. Fauci himself and Klaus Schwab agreed with him. There's a Batman bubble bath, but I've taken all the bubble bath out of it. Never fear, here's a Pez dispenser. Isn't that exciting? I didn't grow up with Toys R Us, by the way. Toys R Us came along. I don't think they opened a Toys R Us in this area until the late 70s, 79, 80, maybe? Even as late as 80. <coughs> and I was born in 65, so growing up, 
the toy stores I knew were more in smaller chains. Uh, in San Antonio, when I was, you know, my mom did a lot of shopping from Sears catalog. So Sears was kind of the toy store for me for Christmas. But uh, I think when I was like in third, fourth grade, the play, and, and when I was younger, when we lived in San Antonio, the big toy store was called Kitty City. I think it was near the North Star Mall. Comet Crypt Keeper would be able to, you know, tell me if how accurate I am at that. But Kitty City was a big, big place. I think it was later bought by Lionel, Lionel Trains. So, anyway, that's what I remember. And then there was a store called Toys by Roy in the Six Flags Mall here in Gratuville. And there was a one called Circus World, they were smaller, that's where I first saw He-Man action figures, which I thought, boy, these are pretty well sculpted, but I wasn't. By the time those came out, what was, about 82 or something? You know, I, I was like, out of high, I was about, almost, I was like a senior in high school, so I wasn't really buying He-Man action figures, if I was a few years younger I might have, but I thought, these are really cool little Conan imitations obviously made because the Conan movie was out and they were cool until the cartoon started and, and then kids had no no longer had a, the ability to use their imagination to determine who He-Man is and these other characters are it was all spelled out for them in this uh, uh, by filmation and so I thought that took away a lot of the play value of the toys Whereas if you just left them open-ended, every kid in every neighborhood could have come up with who He-Man is and all that stuff. Yeah, they were really well sculpted compared to the earlier toys. And then, of course, there was, a, you know, by, by later, you know, I, there was nothing looked like that when I was a kid. Like this, this is amazing. I don't know if McFarl McFarlane started doing... Uh, in the mid eight nineties, started doing uh, really well sculpted stuff. Huh? But, uh, whatever. Okay, you know all this. I don't know why I'm telling you this. Like you're some, but you know, it might be at some point in the future, someone younger than forty you might actually watch this channel and might learn something from my rambling on. I oh, had yeah, a Toys R Us story I wanted to tell you. I'll tell you in a second. Remind me. And if I forget to tell you the story, put it down in the comments and I'll tell you in the next episode. Okay. Oh, this Batmobile won't break because it's, it's a plastic. Oh, I got more Bat vehicles over there. That's right. I was trying to fill this uh, tub up with just Batmobiles so I can take them all out and put them on display in the new place because down in the basement I'm going to have a video arcade and I'm also going to have a couple of rooms with collections of things, uh, bat toys and monster toys and make it an entertainment destination, you know, so people could come and tour this museum, uh, you know, by invitation. Like Four Yackerman style, although um, I'm not making any pretension that my collection's like Forrest Ackerman's. Oh, here's another. This is a. Uh, well, McFarlane is, has the uh, rights to uh, Batman '66 now, as far as making toys. But this this was done by some manufacturer a few years ago. They started making all these Batman '66 toys that. If they had come out in 1966, would have been amazing. Now, you see so many toys, the Batman toys, dated 1966, and people may say, well, how does the show that comes on in 1966 have so much... Why, why all the toys say 66? Because, you know, typically shows come on, the new season starts at the beginning of September, right? So that only is a few months before it's 1967, but that's not what happened. Batman was, came on mid-season. It came on in January of 66. 
it's an exploded in popularity. So for the entire year of 1966, they were cranking out toys and memorabilia and record albums and, and the people doing the Batman theme. So there's a lot of stuff dated 1966. Uh, it's kind of like the Beatles hit in 19, in the United States, the explosion of popularity because of them began. Ed Sullivan was in 64, but January of 64, so there's tons of 1964 dated stuff. Um, a little bit of trivia for you. Captain, ooh, that's, uh, I gotta be careful with this penguin because of his little his little uh, cigarette holder. I don't want that getting broken. I may not pack that in this box. Uh, Captain Strange Life's always talking about 1966 being the great year, and he's not the only person that thinks that. Now I was born in '65, so I don't have a lot of memories of '66, but I I I can see that '66 was the peak of you know. Marvel Comics were really hitting on all cylinders in 65, 66. By around 60, some, maybe about late 67, 68, the panels became bigger and there were less words. And you could tell that you know, Jack Kirby was getting tired of Marvel. And uh, he asked for a raise, didn't get it. And, and supposedly Stanley said, well, just draw fewer panels on each page and then you'll be doing less work for this, you know. So he wasn't caring as much, and he stopped creating new characters. And so that explosion of creativity around 65, 66 petered out. The music in 66, the garage rock, the music, the styles, the dances, the cars, 66 was like a perfect year. Only marred by the Vietnam War and the fact that America had been dealt on mortal blow in late 63 with the assassination of President Kennedy, which ultimately wound up festering all through the 70s and has brought us to the horrible moments that we're in now. But, uh, you know, the more you know about the Kennedy assassination, the more you realize, you know, what, what happened. We will, won't get into that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, um, the Vietnam War was <clears throat> kind of was not a good thing. Um, seems like everything horrible that happens to our country is done by Democrats. You notice that LBJ did a lot of things to hurt us, but '66 was still that last great year about everything. But by '67, you know, the summer of love, hippies took over more and drugs and in the 70s it was everybody was on cocaine and listening to the eagles that was actually the 70s i take that back had a lot of great stuff going on everyone in the 80s and 90s ah the 70s that was a joke you know now you listen to the music from the 70s and it's really great people made fun of it you know but compared to the music of today You'd be amazed today if you heard Seasons in the Sun, a new song like that, or uh, The Carpenters. There's no music like this, as far as I know, coming out today. Um, so, whatever. Okay. But 66 was the last amazing, it was like the height of pop culture. And they're, they're right around 19... 55 to 57, those were great years, too. That's what Trump was talking about when he said, make America great again. He was talking about those years. And everyone says, oh, he, want, he means bring back slavery. I was like, that, that's not what he said. Um, okay, shit. Oh, my goodness. Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be comic book collectors or toy collectors. They'll always have trouble moving and they won't be rambling men. 
was it. I wish I could be a rambling man and get born in the back of a Chevy van or, or Greyhound bus going down highway number 9 or 69 or whatever. I wish I could be one of those motherfuckers without a care in the world. I got to box up 50 million toys just to, only moving 10 hours away, man. You think I could just put a bag over my fucking back and just... Let my highway toes go heading for the north up going up the country, man. That's what we're doing going up the, going up the country, man, to Iowa. Oh, there's more Batmobiles. Shit, motherfucker. Goddamn, goddamn motherfuckers. Okay, what what else can I put in this box? It won't break. <laughs> I'm a rambling, gambling man. There's a flicker card. <laughs> Imagine if this is what they used in the new Batman movie, The Batman. Hi, I'm Robert Pattinson. Uh, the movie, I'm sure, is great. You know, I hear it's very, very dark. I mean, not dark literally, not just, you know, in subject matter, but the photography is very dark. But I just can't get past Bat Bruce Wayne with these long tendrils of greasy hair coming down. Because uh, the people I... Those were like uh, meth heads, you know, the people that had their hair like that. Like, I don't know, Bruce Wayne should be a little more stylish. Oh, but he's depressed, you bullshit. The Batman I remember was always smiling when he was punching people. And uh, to me, a guy smiling while he's punching people with a little 10-year-old helping him also punching people, that's a lot more psychotic than the dark brooding, oh, I'm so depressed, Batman. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, like, it's like smiling when you're hitting people. It's kind of scary and kind of kind of psychotic, and people need to realize that in Hollywood. That uh, what the hell is this? It's a recipe, and I, it's not my mother's handwriting, so it must have fallen out of some old book that I bought. But I save it because I save everything. And who knows? Maybe someday that recipe will make a fine uh, dinner one night. Ay ay ay. cardboard displays uh, comes from some guy on uh, eBay sells these things and so I put them behind the model kits but now I'm uh, filling a box with those over here uh, so this model kit it's my childhood model kit of this. It's been repainted since then. Um, I'll get that in another box. Let me sit back. Oh, man. I think this moves. It'll, it'll gyrate back and forth. There's a little thing on the bottom, like a little crank. But it's you can tell that it's... That's, whoop, shit. It's been done too much, her back is broken, so I don't fuck with it. I'll dust it and I'll put it on a shelf. And, uh, shit. I'll put it on a shelf and then I'll shit. Yeah, that's right. Oh, here's my groovy ghoulies bought in 1972 at the Six Flags Mall when we first visited Gratuville. And then we moved, uh, we came through here at Gratuville because my oldest brother was going to college at the University of Texas at Gratuville and then uh, then we went on to San Antonio where we lived for two years where I had my awakening in 73 74 where I really discovered Marvel superheroes and toys and I became what I am now an idiot 
And then uh, we moved up to Tacoma, Washington for a year, 75, and then we moved back to Gratuville. And I still remember that Six Flags Mall, which has now been demolished, because that is where I bought these PVC Groovy Ghoulies. And uh, there's one of the little weird green kid with the big head. If I still have that, I don't know. It, I mean, if it's going to turn up, it's going to turn up in this move because I've got this house will have to vomit forth all of its contents. So if it's in the dark recesses of some closet, it will turn up. We have to have everything out by uh, April 2nd, which is a Saturday night at midnight. Donald Trump has a rally in Georgia next Saturday. And then the next Saturday, April 2nd, he's somewhere else. And uh, so two Donald Trump rallies from now will have to be out of this house. Two Saturdays from now. But I'm hoping we'll be out before then. Oh. It's a purple people eater. See? Uh, one horned. Let's see, how'd the song go? It was a one horn. One horn, one eyed, flying purple people eater. Then they describe the toes, too. Uh, everything, and then there's two wings. There's a, everything that's in the song, trust me, is replicated. So whoever designed this was listening to the song and taking copious notes. So I'll have you know it's an accurate representation of uh, the purple people eater from the Pleiadian, uh, the Pleiadian Purple People Eater. Um, uh, oh, God almighty. Oh, let's get these boxes down, shall we? <laughs> oh, you're, you're slipping. Man. You're supposed to be like that, aren't you? Okay. This is an empty box. It's um, shrink wrap. So I, I don't know. It's um, free Batman badge to cut out and wear. Made in Hong Kong. Okay. Okay. Let's put that in here. This is something I got somewhere. It's not. It's supposed to be fireworks, but this is some fake thing. Uh, replica, I think. I'm going to put some model kits, I guess, in this other box that's down here that you'll have to pretend that you can't see. These are uh, replicas of the original weirdos. Some company has gotten the rights to weirdos. I keep seeing it on Facebook. Or, I'm sorry, Meta. And uh, some company is doing new weirdo stuff, masks and stuff. Some, some company that does Count Chocula stuff for your kitchen and stuff. Mon they do monster stuff. a Batmobile I never built. It says Batman. Batman. No, I don't know how they pronounce it, but sure a cool representation of our heroes there. Batman. Turns into a giant robot. I ran out of paper toweling. Uh, there's more. Um, you'll probably put down in the comments you're packing them all wrong. That is the wrong way. You should be using peanuts. I have peanuts downstairs I'm going to be using for built up model kits, but. Um, David Wilcock, this 
UFO guy. I enjoy listening to him talk on YouTube. He's written a bunch of books. I, I just enjoy David Wilcock. He just seems like a cool guy. You should subscribe to him. But anyway, yesterday he put up, he's living up in the mountains of Colorado where they get like unbelievable amounts of snow. And he was, he had lost power and he did all these videos, like a two, almost three hour video he put up yesterday on YouTube showing how he builds a fire when the power's out and uh, how he gets his generator going and how he walks his dog in snow that's this high. And, uh, he was saying, well, I know you guys are going to be putting down in the comments below that I'm doing this all wrong, but I'm used to that. Uh, what fucking now? Oh, there's more Batman stuff that I can't get to, can I? Oh, there's more Batman stuff over here. One second. Oh. Well, the, the deal is that uh, today is Sunday. I believe tomorrow my, my friend Gerald's going to show up. And uh, I won't have any money until the closing on this house, which is Wednesday. So he's going to use his credit card to get a U-Haul, like a 20-foot U-Haul. And then we're going to uh, uh, fill it up on uh, Tuesday. And then when the house closes on Wednesday, we're going to get in that U-Haul and head up. We're going to uh, use a, we're going to drag behind my car. And then once we get up there and unload that, then we're going to get into my car. He has to take the drive shaft or something out of the car for us to tow it the Subaru. So then, uh, he knows how to do stuff like that, which I don't know anything about anything. So then he's, then we're, then we're going to, uh, unpack that and then come back and then run another U-Haul and take a 20 foot. And then we're going to take as much stuff back as we can. Then we might do a third run, but if not everything else, we're just going to have to get professional moving idiots to come and take that out. So here we got Batman and Robin, and I've got this uh, Vampirella holding on to the car. Um, it's pretty well sculpted, as you can see. Um, yes, indeed. Okay, I don't think these Mego, uh, fucking ugly Mego things are, gonna, are that breakable. It's not my childhood Batman, or is. No, I don't know. I got this Batman somewhere. I don't think... I don't think that's my child. I wouldn't have treated it that bad. This one, you can kind of tell, has been in water. This Batman. Um, I would take my Aquaman into the bathtub, but I don't think there would be any purpose to take Batman into the bathtub. This is the... Uh, 1989 Batman. And he has little hatches, the little, they'll, they'll open up and machine guns come out. So, you know, he can shoot and open doors, but, you know, I don't really think Tim Burton did any research, really, into Batman. And just, uh, he and Zack Snyder seem to think that Batman's all about guns. It's like, did you do any research? Okay. Oh, I was going to put this guy in there. I'm not even going to wrap that. There's no point. It's, it's pretty indestructible. It's ugly, but indestructible. Wish I'd want a better shape. Now, if you live near southern Iowa and want to come and help us unload, or you want to help in any way uh, as we get into that house. Uh, there's a lot of rooms in that house, and I'm going to turn it into kind of a museum. I'll name a room after you. It's like it'll be the official John Smith room, you know, of the collection. But uh, oh, we'll we'll 
we'll feed you and uh, try to get you, you know, repaid something financially if you want to help us. We're not getting as much money as we had hoped for this house. And uh, that's... Uh, rich as I was hoping, but we'll be doing okay because we won't have a mortgage at least, and that's more than a lot of people can say, so I'm not going to complain too much. Uh, this is the this is much better than their bad mobile. This is my childhood bat, bat cycle and bat sidecar for Robin. This one I'll put wrapping. all day putting them up more videos than you can probably watch but this is very recent vintage this little Riddler thing This was my older brother's car. This is something that actually came down in the family. This is a, a dinky toy, Ford Zephyr. Dinky toys were made in England, along with Corgi toys. I used to pronounce it Corgi, because I didn't have any, I didn't know how it was pronounced. I just saw it on the bottom of toys. And, uh, and of course, in the 90s, this British girl sternly reprimanded me and said, it's pronounced Corgi. Okay, how am I supposed to fucking know how you idiots? Why do you name your dogs such stupid names, man? You give them a name that people can pronounce, like real Americans, the guys that invented English. Fucking bootleg British people telling us how to pronounce the language. Fuck them, man. Fuck them. Uh, I bet this is from Auburn, uh, which is a pl uh, kind of a rubber company. It's kind of rubber. It's not plastic. A little hot rod. They made those. Uh, my oldest brother had a giant collection of army men and vehicle tanks, half tracks, from a company called Auburn. So to me, those are the real green army men, because that's what he bought, and that's what I played with as a kid, and. Uh, he later, and I had them for years, then he, he kind of wanted them back for his children, and I'm sure they're long since in a landfill. Uh, but I need to reclaim a bunch of Auburn Army men. I bought a half track from eBay a few, 10 years ago, just to remind me of that those magnificent days. My brother and I would put the Army men all out in a room, and he had rubber band guns, and you'd shoot them, and that whatever, guys fell, those were the ones that that died, right? I'm sure you guys did all the same stuff. Okay, a bunch of mad paperbacks over here. Need to be uh, put somewhere. Alright. Shiza, what fell? This is the... There was a Barbie and Ken uh, Batman. And this, this is pretty good, I think. Now, when Barbie and Ken did Morticia and Gomez Adams, I thought the, the Ken was lame, but the Barbie was great. But you had to get him as a pair. And when they did the Munsters, the Lily Munster was great. And the Ken Herman Munster was lame. So, usually Barbie can... 
I'm gonna start putting in some extra, some of these dolls at the top of this box, I guess. Oh, let's get the Gene Simmons figure down and see. I told this story a million times. There used to be a video store in Denton, Texas, up north of here. It's quite a drive. And there was, on the town square upstairs, was a video store called The Dodd Files. It was run by this old cranky guy named Dodd. And he was into all the same culture we're into. And so he would get all the something weird video VHS tapes. I would go up there and rent them, bring them back to Gratuville with my VCR set up. I would make copies and then return them to Dodd because that way I'd save money because they were expensive, I think $20 a tape from something weird. This is before DVD. Uh, but then I started getting suspicious that Dodd was getting the something weird tapes, making copies, putting them in the shell, and renting out copies because he didn't want the originals getting damaged by potheads going to the local school up there in North Texas. So I was like, oh, man, if I'm making a copy of a copy, it's it's already some of those something weird tapes. Sometimes they'd look good, sometimes they didn't, because Mike Vrainy that ran that company out of his attic, you know, it depended on what VCR he was recording on on that day. I think he had a whole chain of VCRs set up, and if it was earlier in the chain, it's probably better quality than the one that's further in the chain. So whatever, it was very, it, it bothered my... Uh, obsessive compulsiveness but anyway Dodd a lot of times I'd be driving around I'd hear him talking on talk radio because he was always calling up talk radio anyway he made super 8 stop motion films but dirty ones I've never seen one but he took action figures and altered them and so he could do his th like he, he made them anatomically correct he changed things he would cut off the fingertips of Mego figures and glue them on to a doll's breast to give them nipples. He was crazy. I wish I'd see some, but sometimes when he was done with the figures, he'd sell them. And so, uh, you might have seen some of these before, and they were also seen on the Hypnotic Eye, the show I made with Joe Riley back in the 90s. Some of these might have been on the shelf since that show was filmed. I don't know, remember, I, I remember I moved in the 90s and then moved back, and I don't know, I don't remember if the hypnotic eye was filmed before or after, probably after that move. Yeah, probably, probably after. Don't really remember. Okay. So. I'm just assuming you can hear me when uh, I'm behind the camera. Anyway, I got a Gene Simmons Mego figure from him, and he'd altered it. Uh, Mego in the late 70s was trying to experiment by making really big action figures and really small action figures. But um, they made, uh, you know, the Kiss figures. But uh, I guess he thought that Gene Simmons' body was too scrawny, so he got a Superman, Christopher Reeve, giant Superman figure, and he took the body. So this body, that's actually Superman's body and the Gene Simmons' head. And uh, I, he made a lot of action figures anatomically correct so that uh, he could make his dirty X-rated stop-motion animated uh, figures, uh, toy toy uh, movies. But I always thought, did he make Gene Simmons anatomically correct? It was always up on a shelf. And now that I'm taking it down, 
I'm not going to undress them, but I can feel that there is nothing there. See? There's nothing there. So this is not one of the figures that he made anatomically correct. So, yeah, you can see on the back that it says DC Comics on the back of Gene Simmons. So, and it looks like this is glued to the back. So, yeah, that's what he did. That's why this Gene Simmons is a little bit more powerful looking than the average one but that I guess is a good idea you know if you're you know it's sacrilege now but in the 90s these toys weren't that old and you could find them at thrift stores and stuff so I just I guess you know now that would probably be sacrilege to take heads off of one figure and put them on the other but that's something old Dodd did and I doubt that Dodd's still around. Seems like he was always smoking, and he was, uh, that would have been 30-something, 30 30,000 years ago, I think, back in the 90s. He's, uh, okay. Oh, this is uh, another Dodd creation. It's Angie Dickinson's policewoman's head but it's Dolly Parton's body, and there's Amigo finger put on his Amigo fingers put on tips put on his nipples. Right? She's got a gun and a bottle. This one's anatomically correct. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you can see. Shit. There's there, he put some fur in there. Uh, so, yeah, this is a <laughs> fucking idiot. Uh, okay. Now, my, my Toys R Us story. Joe Riley, my old friend, who is uh, my late friend, Joe Riley, uh, painted and built this and painted it for me. It's a vinyl model kit of Judge Anderson from the Judge Dredd comic book, right? And they sculpted her face to look exactly like Deborah Harry. Now, I need to dust this thing, but he he was very he was a, he was very good. Look at that. But what happened is I went to Toys R Us to buy this. I go to the cash register. This is in the 1990s, and the girl said, "This has been recalled. I can't sell this to you." And there was a whole bunch of these on the shelf. But something was wrong with the action, the recalled. I don't know. Maybe it's dangerous for little kids or something. So I, I was not going to take no for an answer. What I did is I went back and got, I took the, whatever this cost, let's say it was $20. I found another toy that was $20, maybe like a Betsy Wetsy or something. I took the price tag off of that. It just peeled off very easily and put it on the Judge Anderson and then took it up to a different cash register clerk and it sold to me right away and I was able to get my Judge Anderson then my friend Joe Riley built it so they didn't want to sell this to me. I don't know if it's because it doesn't stand properly because if you look she she leans back um, I don't know if you can really tell on the camera angle. See the, the base? Let me get the base even with the uh, bottom of the video screen. So there, okay, there we go. So he kind of leans back. So you kind of have to put her up against the wall. It looks like she's leaning back against the wall. But it's not, maybe they all leaned back. This is my, my friend Joe put screws in there to keep her in place. But she still just naturally leans back. So, uh, or maybe they just thought it was too risque to be selling at Toys R Us. I don't know. But, uh, anyway, I got it, and it's here in the collection. And what I'm going to do in this new place is I'm going to have a whole shelf or two of nothing but model kits that Joe Riley built. And I'm going to have it, this little sign, that Joe Riley, who he was, as an exhibit in this museum. So that it may be the biggest collection in the world of Joe Riley made model kits because uh, his own personal collection I don't know what happened to his stuff when he passed away I heard that I don't know and people always ask me what happened to the puppet that he handmade 
that, that's just a big eye. It's a Cyclops eye uh, that he used for the Hypnotic Eye TV show. Um, I said, I don't know what happened to it. Because uh, for a good 10 years after Joe Riley, before Joe Riley passed away, I didn't really talk with him. He just, he was a very moody guy, very, uh, just one day he just stopped answering calls. And I assumed he was mad at me or something, or about something or other. And then one day on MySpace, uh, get a friend request from someone with a rat fink looking face. And I had a rat fink looking face. And and I realized it was Joe Riley. And I said, hey, it's me, you know. And then we were talking on the computer. Hey, yeah, it's great to hear from you. And we were friends again. And we made plans to go to a Universal Monster Convention over in Great Garlu, Texas, which is about six, seven miles from here. And all was cool. And then the next morning I get a call from an old friend. Hey, did you, did you hear about Joe Riley? And yeah, it's like, whoa, no. And he passed away. So I, I could have been the last person that talked with him, you know, or, or typed to him. He passed away right just... That's one of those things where you kind of makes you realize that there is something up there for those of you that doubt that uh, it's like the chances I, that I talk with I make up with this guy hours before he passes away. So if so, yeah, something to, um, and if you don't believe in God just look at the evil around us and that makes you kind of if there's that much evil in people worshiping Satan well I mean maybe you don't believe in God but the people the, the a lot of the people running things today really believe in Moloch and when you said well that doesn't really exist well they think that he does and they're working in his interests so when the gas prices go up and there's no food on the shelves, and you're wearing three masks. There's uh, little Satan worshippers laughing and chuckling that this is furthering their uh, great reset, their great world, new world order. Yeah, so whatever. But that's just a conspiracy theory. Things are actually going very well here in the United States. Anyone that says that that's not true should be canceled because they're bad people and uh, they're not uh, they're not working for the greater good for the greater good I don't know what the F this is it's some cartoon that's on TV now I guess but I bought this at Walmart just because I thought it would look good with my Batman collection uh, some I'm sure if I actually saw the cartoon it's from, I would realize how idiotic it is, and I'd be horribly, you know, th this would be problematic. As the Great Reset idiots like to use that word, problematic. Okay. So, so, something like this. This is problematic because it offends people with eating disorders. This is going to make them feel bad about their body image. But... That's how the cookie crumbles, man. Let's see. Oh, I should mention cookies to people with eating disorders. <laughs> Here's a little Batman ring. It's not originally from 66, but you can tell it's from the same mold. It was, I think, orange. I just spray painted it silver. So people would think it's super valuable, made of silver. There's a little miniature rat fink charm that you used to get out of a machine. I don't think that's an original from the 60s, but a repop. Still cool. This is a club that a guerrilla soldier would beat humans to death with in Planet of the Apes. Um, that needs to be reunited with the guerrilla soldier in the other room. Here's a little uh, puppy. How about that? How about that one? Oh, I was supposed to be getting these boxes down, weren't I? Wasn't I? <laughs> All right, let's move the Catwoman down. It's a bobblehead Catwoman. No, I'm not. Fuck you.
Oh, there's another Dodd creation over here. Let's get that. Yeah, the 1990s. I remember Dodd. I remember Joe Riley. Those were good times. I, I first met a guy named Eddie Holland. And he, he and Joe Riley were doing a public access show called Monster Attack Team. And on that show, they would show giant Japanese monsters and superheroes. And, and Eddie Holland was super into Kamen Rider, and he was into Kiss. And his friend Joe was into Ultraman and comic books, EC Comics and stuff like that. And, uh, and right about the time I met them, the two of them, their friendship dissolved. So I hung out with Joe Riley about the and and then Eddie Holland separately but they had a great show it's let's see here it's weird you know he did a show with Joe Riley and then their friendship dissolved and then I did a show the hypnotic eye with Joe Riley and then our friendship dissolved so maybe maybe um Joe didn't, I don't know, maybe that had something to do with me, like calling him up too often and, hey, I've got an idea, or this or that, and maybe it's just started annoying him. I think that's what happened. Okay, this is another Dodd creation, and this one's kind of interesting. You can kind of tell me what he did here. He has, I think this skull is from a model kit, probably. He put some hair on it, and then he's got an outfit... I don't know if this is from the Johnny West series or what. Uh, I don't think this is he, not handmade. See, it's got a gun and a holster. It really needs to be. This hasn't been dusted in decades. But yeah, he's a, a dead cowboy. And imagine how, if you could find the Super 8 film that stars this guy, it would be amazing. But anyway... This is uh, something created by that crazy old guy in Denton. Uh, so you could tell me in the comments below what figure line. This is the size of a G.I. Joe, by the way. Could be a G.I. Joe body, it could, or it could be... I don't know. I've never undressed him to find out. But and let's see if he's anatomically correct. No. But apparently some are. So... Yes, indeed. How about that one? This is a... They used to sell this... You could get this uh, outfit and put it on a Barbie. So... This is a... Maleficent. Yes, indeed. Oh, that Batman I showed you earlier, the Ken Batman, 66 Batman, this is the Barbie Julie Newmar, uh, isn't that great? getting to where I can get to what I wanted to get to. This is just from, what is that dumb place called, CVS, or is it from Walgreens? They used to, every every year, Halloween, they would have all this Nightmare Before Christmas. Nightmare Before Christmas would have been great if it had good music, because all those old Christmas specials had great music, and the music in that was terrible. It would have been a classic if the music wasn't so awful. I mean, it's kind of important in a musical that the music's good. I, I don't know. It just seems like that's common sense. Okay. What I'm going to do with these model kits is I'm going to put them in, a, in, in empty comic book uh, long boxes and then put some peanuts in there. And these, are, they, these fit. They're, they're not any taller than a comic book, these Aurora model kits, and uh, 
So it'll fit right in there and they won't move around too much. You can probably get about six or seven of these model kits in a box. I already filled one comic box with them. See this one, you see this the original James Bama art on the box. He's got a blue light reflecting on him. So some people paint. I didn't paint this one. I got it. It's very nicely painted. I've got another one. Someone did the same thing. They painted it to look like the model kit box and they still kept the glow-in-the-dark snake these glow-in-the-dark pieces on these old aurora kits glow like it's i had to put it up against that ring light and uh, let you see maybe i'll do that on another episode right now i got things to do man stop distracting me okay all right so then there's a wonder woman box oh it's just the lid isn't it i remember now Yeah, it's just bro a broken lid. It doesn't have the bottom, but it looks good on display behind the model kit. Uh, yeah. Bullshit. This must have been my older brother's. This must be the high school he went to when he was like in, uh, I guess, 11th grade in... Uh, Hampton, Virginia, when we lived there in 1972-73. But um, I'm sure that's problematic now that they have uh, that as their mascot. But uh, and that school may not even be there anymore because the elementary school I went to in Hampton has been closed permanently. So that means that the neighborhood is probably not what it used to be when they start closing up schools uh, usually it's not a good sign okay now I need to start getting the Munster stuff packed up these are Mexican Munster figures you can often see them for sale or in the old days I don't know if you still can on uh, the fuck do they call it eBay? We start forgetting such things like, well, what is that called? Oh yeah, eBay. What is that stuff people drink? Oh, oh yeah, it's called water. You start forgetting real common things. You know, it's like you're pretty much toast. All right. Yeah. This dust is starting to get to me. Here's a bobblehead Eddie Munster. Not old. Those those uh, Mexican ones. I don't. Those could be old. They might be from the 70s. I think mean, maybe they actually are from the 60s. But I don't think. I don't think they have a lot of value. This is actually like a little Shriner guy. I just stuck that little monster head on him. Uh yes. Yes. sit down for a second. Um, gosh darn it. Oh, there's a... I gotta get this Batmobile in here. Okay. And the purple people eater. Okay. The camera was sitting on the back of this chair. This the Shriner hat or whatever this is was holding up the camera. That was my tripod. Um, I was also packing through papers, and I found a few things I thought I could show you. I think where, where did I put them? What is this? Um, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Oh, I see what it is. It's, um... This is, um... It's just St. Patrick's Day. My, uh... On the 
paternal grand, uh, great grandfather. This must have been uh, his printing company over in the old country. McGuyan, pr the printer, Monaghan, executes printing for people living in 28 out of the 32 counties in Ireland. His motto is promptitude, neatness, and accuracy, and his business is steadily increasing. Write today for samples in gold, silver, red, chocolate, blue, and black. Yeah, this is all a bunch of stuff about that part of Ireland, so that's cool. Pictures of... Uh, My grandfather, um, who was, this is him when he was playing for the Chicago Cubs. That's the, the, the printer was the father of his wife, the Irish printer. Oh, what is this? Oh, this is his, uh, this is like his health records, the baseball player. There's an honorable discharge from... What? My dad was in the Navy? Okay, what? Okay, so... Say twenty-eight. Okay, I know that my father, born in the late twenties, was too young to be in World War II. And then the story I was always heard is that he was the day he the day after he graduated from college, he was drafted into the Korean War, and uh, I assumed he was in the army. And then from then on until he retired in 1976, but then later I realized, okay, he got out of the army and worked in a department store as a manager or something, and then he went back into the army and went for, uh, uh, yeah. But this says, honorably discharged from the United States Navy, June 1950. Well, that was before the Korean War, wasn't it? So maybe he was in the Navy. It says the Navy Reserve. In, it says inactive reserve. Oh, okay. So maybe he was in... He went in... Oh, he went in on June 29th, 1946. So he was in the Naval Reserve while he was in college. Got drafted in the Army, I guess. Oh, this, this is... Here it is. Uh, this is, he's honorably discharged from the Army, July 1952, July 16th, 52. So that means that he was then going, okay, then he was a civilian for a, a couple of years, maybe a year or two, and then went back into the Army. Okay. Uh, I guess they give you this when you're discharged from the Army. Your family. A select family income plan of security, secure in the thought that they can depend upon you. So, security for the years ahead, and they have all the, how you figure out your, your uh, income and future years. This is July 1st, 1957. Okay, so he's back in the Army. He must be figuring out if he spends 20 years in the army, what he's going to be paid when he uh, retires, that must be what this is. So then, okay, so maybe he was out of the army for several years, and then he retired in 76. So that would, yeah, 57, that would make about 20 years. Okay, just finding papers, you know, that I'm obviously bringing with me. I'm not chunking them in the trash. This is, uh, This is original art by me. I did this for the uh, my magazine I used to do. So that's artwork I did back in the late 80s. So hopefully it's not too problematic. 
Let's see. Uh, well, it says pinko. It makes fun of pinkos and stuff, so hopefully it doesn't offend you. If you're a pinko. Anyway, original artwork. They grow to Orlock. This is a cover up the name. I had a student that was obsessively uh, obsessive about drawing pictures of, of Bambi and other characters. Um, so that's, I save student artwork when I really am impressed with it. Because she wasn't like copying from pictures. She was all, it was amazing. She'd do Bambi, the whole family, you know that. Here's a whole uh, little folder of Japanese uh, uh, stuff. Um, people now just call it Power Rangers, but back back in the 90s when I first met Eddie Holland, Eddie Holland and Joe Riley, this was all uh, fascinating. Just this wonderful world of Japanese superheroes, and of course Power Rangers kind of ruined it with their stupid Americanization of it. And uh, but. Here's a 3D poster. I got a, a million of these. But, oh, and on the back there's a 3D Godzilla. All kinds of all kinds of Japanese stuff. Maybe I should show all this once I get up there. And uh, here's my uh, good friend uh, Thomas Thomas Renoni that uh, passed away. This is his uh, the thing they gave out at. Uh, his funeral. Um, yeah, that's how he looked when I first met him in college. But uh, 2016, man, it's been November 28, 2016. I remember he called up and wanted to go. He said, oh, "Let's go see Doctor Strange." So it's about the time the first Doctor Strange came out. So it's been a while. So, uh, since that movie came out. Now the sequel's finally out soon. Okay, what is all this shiza shit? Um, uh, this stuff we need to file away. This was a, an illustration I did for a, a friend of mine did a magazine called Makumba. I did this cover for him. This is a copy of the original art. this oh this is a significant certificates of authenticity that the two photographs of Betty Page that are signed by her that they're authentic unfortunately the 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 thick you know pictures aren't fixed properly at the time that they're made in the chemicals and they start fading and but the, list, the, the autograph is still there. So what I did is before they faded completely, I made a color copy of the original picture and then I have those pictures framed. And then if the photograph of her completely disappears, then I can always just have that, the part she signed for, matted with a real picture of her that doesn't fade. And this is, uh, that shows that Julie Newmar signed a picture. This is a letter from Barbara Lay, who was, uh, if you remember in the latter days of the Vampirella Warren magazine, there was some covers that had photographs instead of paintings of Vampirella. And the model that posed on those covers, I think might have wound up being possibly if, if Hammer had actually not kind of gone out of business or well, they were they were going to make a vampirella movie and it was even advertised on the back cover of vampirella magazine that that was in the works for the late 70s but it didn't happen she, i think she might have become the vampirella but anyway this is dated june 19 1996 dear kenneth thank you for your interest in my fan club i put the fan club on hold as i am writing my bio Enclosed, please find a pic picture price list for mail order and a couple of signed postcards that I hope you will enjoy. I'll update you on the book when it's available. Thank you for thinking of me. Take care and God bless. Love, Barbara. 
So I guess that's actually an autograph. And then it's, what's, what is she selling here? Color, $15, black and white, $10. And then she's also selling original Warren magazines, appearing on covers of issues 67, 69, 71, 73, 74, 76, 77, 78. So for a good, good, yeah, run there from the late 60s, it's one, two, three. For about eight issues, they didn't have to pay anyone to uh, paint the cover. Magazine cover photos available. Anyway, yeah. So, she was selling pictures back then. How about that? That friend that I just showed you that passed away, he had this, he commissioned this to be made, this Ed Gein bust. And he used to sell this, this is an ad. He used to sell it in a, in a Psychotronic magazine. Oh, here's one that's not on red paper. Yeah, I don't know. Remember who he had? Some someone that he knew sculpted it. He probably tells you here. Uh, master Hollywood sculptor Glenn Hans. Yeah. Oh, he 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 did prominent work in Coppola's Dracula, and he was the 1992 Academy Award winner for best makeup. He. Uh, sculpted that and then he got some of his friends out there in Hollywood to write reviews like Johnny Ramone all the kiddies should have one he was good friends with Johnny Ramone got Tom Savini to sign it uh, Brian Usna the producer director reanimator he got Dave Friedman to sign it the producer of Blood Feast 2000 Maniacs on that Ed Neal the hitchhiker in Texas Chainsaw Massacre Got the editor of Fangoria to sign it, Michael Weldon, the guy behind Psychotronic, Eric Caden that ran Hollywood Book and Poster out in Hollywood, and Johnny Legend. Not the Johnny Legend of today, but the real Johnny Legend that had the big beard, the one that put out the uh, Sleaze Mania tapes from Rhino uh, Records. He was, he was a rockabilly singer, not this Johnny Le John Legend today, this is some kind of rap guy or something. Well, speaking of Rhino, here's a Rhino video catalog, which is done EC style by, I'm sure that's William Stout. Or actually not. Pearson and Simons. But anyway, this, uh, this rockabilly Rhino is showing up to torment these hippies with uh, real rock and roll music. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It has all their records. I don't know if this is before. Yeah, this is actually during the CD era. It has compact discs. Here's a... Remember that movie AI? This is like sent out to teachers. How can you use AI in your classroom to teach kids about their horrible future? Keep your kids far away from virtual reality goggles and meta, meta, meta. Yeah. The Lone Ranger Creed by Fran Stryker. I believe that to have a friend, a man must be one. That all men are created equal and that everyone has within himself the power to make this a better world. That God put the firewood there but that every man must gather and light it himself. In being prepared physically, mentally and morally to fight when necessary for that which is right, that a man should make the most of what equipment he has, that this government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall live always, that men should live by the rule of what is best for the greatest number, that sooner or later, somewhere, somehow, we must settle with the world and make payment for what we have taken. For all things change but truth, and that truth alone lives on forever in my creator, my country, my fellow man. Imagine a hero like the Lone Ranger that lives by this. You know, that would be just antithetical to the people today that want to make all their heroes these anti-heroes and shit. Scumbags. 
Let's see. The Marvel Superheroes was a syndicated cartoon produced in Canada. It premiered in the fall of 1966 on stations in the United States and around the world. The series was broadcast in strip syndication, which meant a new episode aired every weekday. Each episode was made up of three seven-minute shorts featuring one of fine mar one of five Marvel characters: Captain America Mondays, the Incredible Hulk Tuesdays, the Invincible Iron Man. Wednesdays, the Mighty Thor, Thursdays, and Prince Namor, the Submariner, Fridays. That's very clever. Hopefully, I don't think that's a coincidence that they put Thor on Thursday, since Thursday, you probably know, is named after Thor. It was Thor's Day. And Wednesday is named after Odin. You know all that shit. A total of 65 episodes were produced, 13 for each character, which adds up to a total of 195 segments. This is a, I've lost you, so why should I care? This is some eBay ad I printed. Theta Barra was once a huge movie star. Now very few people know who she was. She made the first Cleopatra movie, but it's lost to time. I mean, it's, unless, sometimes movies will turn up in, in countries that are shut off to the world, like Cuba. It'll turn out someone has an archive of films and, and a lot of silent movies spread everywhere around the globe because you didn't really have to know the language they translated anywhere. Sometimes movies turn up, but movies like Cleopatra and London After Midnight with Lon Chaney seem to be long gone. But anyway, Theta Barrow was not her real name. She was actually from New York. She had probably a very, I forget what her real name was, but probably like Flo Steinberg or something like that. Uh, it wasn't that, but... Theta Bera, if you, if you uh, scramble the letters around, it's an anagram for Era the Death. And they made a big deal of that back in the 20s, because back then vamps were the, the it was cool to be like a mysterious vampire looking girl. The Dr. Pepper Bottling Company of Fort Worth, this is from the back of I just a copy I made from one of my old yearbooks. I have all these lists of things I've got to do. I find them and I save them, you know. i got to get the Doctor Strange Treasury Edition. I've got to find a used car, a Chevy van, or an Astro. I've got to get a lawnmower belt. And then some song records I was looking for. And then some, uh, yeah. Whatever. Where did I get this from? I probably got this in some workshop I went to. The Starfish Story. A young man is walking along the ocean and sees a beach on which thousands and thousands of starfish have washed ashore. Further along, he sees an old man walking slowly and stooping often, picking up one starfish after another and tossing each one gently into the ocean. Why are you throwing starfish into the ocean, he asks. Because the sun is up and the tide is going out, and if I don't throw them further, if I don't throw them further in, they will die. But old man, don't you realize there are miles and miles of beach and starfish all along it? You can't possibly save them all. You can't even save one tenth of them. In fact, even if you work all day, your efforts won't make any difference at all. The old man listened calmly and then bent down to pick up another starfish and threw it into the sea. It made a difference to that one. This must have been given at some teaching seminar where they try to remind you, you know, your mission and how you know you're, you're there's a lot of kids you may not be able to help because they're they're so far into gangs and but eventually sometimes you can't yeah, you know, that kind of brings tears in my eyes. I like that, so that's why I must have saved it. Um, yeah, you know, you just make a difference in one person's or some people's lives. And the others, maybe eventually, something you said at some point will sink in. Um, here's Vampira uh, leaning out of a... She's going around just in, in L.A. just trying to publicize her show. Um, What's wrong with McDonald's? What is some little weird flyer? 
The evidence in the McLibel trial has backed up all these criticisms 100%. This is something they like put on your windshield when you're in Kmart, you know, and it's like McDonald's spends over 1.8 billion each every year worldwide on advertising and promotions trying to cultivate an image of being a caring and green company that is also a fun place to eat. Children children are lured in, dragging their prints behind with the promise of toys and other gimmicks, and it goes on. It says the behind the smiling face of Ronald McDonald this lies the reality. McDonald's only interest is money, making profits from whichever and whatever they can, just like all multinational companies. McDonald's annual reports talk of global domination. They aim to open, well, supposedly they're going to pull out of Russia to show Putin. Actually make, make his people healthier. That's real punishment. I stand with the people of Ukraine. I'm going to stop playing Russian roulette and I'm going to show Putin that I am not for him. I'm giving up Russian roulette and I stand. I'm going to put the flag of Ukraine on my Facebook page and I am a hero. Let's see. Oh, yes, and here's the ad uh, for Marvel superheroes that you saw in the Marvel comics. Here's another one. Here's a little uh, Thark bursting from the egg. This is the first Martians that John Carter saw in Edgar Rice Burroughs' novels were these little babies coming out of eggs. And still today, if you tell a little kid, draw a Martian, they'll start drawing a little green man because that's still in our popular consciousness. After over 100 years, we still think... Uh, that they are uh, little green men, even though when they were fully grown, they were 15 feet tall. The, the males were with four arms. Um, here's that little comic strip I was showing you a minute ago. Uh, but yeah, the people have forgotten John Carter. They remember Tarzan, but John Carter was once really big, enough that it still sticks in our mind that even kids somehow picking up what they, from popular culture around them, we still think of little green men in these flying saucers. Oh, this is that the girl that drew the Bambi also drew these these kind of these kind of horses, devil horses and stuff. So I stay save my students cool artwork. Yes indeed. Yes indeed. I need to get this framed and put it behind my robot so that you know, maybe I'll have this framed and have it next to my big Lou when I get to the new the new uh, digs. Okay, this is the photo of this is a folder of color copies. Let's put those in the box. <laughs> Fruit juicy. What happened to the Hawaiian Punch commercials? Did they even make Hawaiian Punch anymore? I don't think they do in the metal, the big metal uh, cylinders anymore. I think it's uh, probably sold in little packs or plastic bottles. Oh, I remember this. I got to tell you a story behind this. There used to be a bar we hung out in in college called Skippy's Mistake. And Skippy was... Uh, Guy, scruffy guy with a ball cap, a scruffy guy, probably kind of look like me now. But uh, he had been an Eagle Scout, like a straight arrow guy. He, he liked to ride bikes all around Europe and stuff. Anyway, he wanted to open a bar, and people said, that's going to be a mistake, and so he called it Skippy's Mistake. Anyway, so Jimi Hendrix seemed to be always playing on the jukebox. There was a sand in the back where you could play volleyball it was a it was an old mexican restaurant he had it picked up moved back further from the street so it could give some kind of rules about the bar has to be further back from the street he put some old car a european car up on top of the roof it was just a it's still there i think it has a different name now 
but you'd have college girls in there and you would have kind of street filth in there too. I mean, it was just, uh, you know, I'd go in there and my college professor that I had a test for the next day would be in there, you know, it was just uh, all kinds of people would show up in there. One day we saw that they had a newsletter. Someone had made a newsletter and it was called The Misinformer. And it said, if Will Rogers only knew at the top, and it was typed, and it was all about the local, the, the, the regular patrons, and you gossip about them, and it was just meant to be a fun thing. So, so we took this thing, we made an exact copy of it, except we called it the Howling Fetus, and we typed it exactly the way they did, with lots of all capitals. And so just looking at this, if you picked it up, you'd think it was their newsletter until you read the title. It was like a perfect parody. Like National Lampoon used to make the parodies look exactly like the, if they were doing a parody of Life magazine or whatever, Mad, they would make it look like the original. And that's what I wanted to do. <coughs> but so... <laughs> So I remember people got so pissed, and we just like put it there in their rack with their other ones. And I remember people like, "Who brought? Who made this? I will get that motherfucker who made this." <laughs> They'll go around the parking lot. Who made this? <laughs> oh, and it even says here, "The Howling Fetus, formerly the Misinformer." Like this is the next issue, and they've just decided to change the name. <laughs> I'll read some of it, what I can, because some of it's. In the 80s, when this was made, in the mid-80s, you could probably get away with a lot more than you can now. Oh, and I even drew Skippy there at the bottom. That's my artwork. There's Skippy. And he's saying, What the fuck is the matter with you pathetic puny humans? Subscribe to the Howling Fetus or die like the ants you truly are. Send five bucks to this address, Department of Health and Human Services, Public Health Service, Alcohol, Drug Abuse, and Mental Health Administration, Rockville, Maryland. <laughs> Let's see, it says at the top, If Buck, see, instead of Will Rogers only knew, I put, If Buck Rogers only knew. The Howling Fetus, Free, formerly The Misinformer, no, Volume 1, Number 7, when in scenic Arlington, visits Skippy's mistake. Skippy says hurry up and sign up for his national MDA knife fight competition. The tournament will begin at 8 p.m. Wednesday the 28th. Losers will be fed to, to wild dogs chained in the back for proper Skippy sanitation. And don't forget... Every Tuesday till the fall, Skippy wants his patrons, especially the boys, to beat the fucking shit out of their wives, lovers, or sweethearts. Remember, old Ben got free beer for a week for smashing his wife, Morla Jean's face through a hot water heater. Morla feels they'll take first again this week, too, since old Ben just kicked out her teeth, so catch up, Skippy. Gee whiz, fall softball leagues are about to start, and the only thing we've got is the team name. Big fucking tits. So hurry up and try out this Thursday at 8.30 at the Stop 6 Club in Fort Worth. Skippy has increased the price of beer to help him buy PCP for the team members. Here and there. Remember Wednesday, a satanic cult and human sacrifice night. 50 cent beer with every purchase of a decapitated human head. Many of you have been wondering why so many of the girls who come here tip the scales at more than 250 pounds. Well, Skippy says, I had them all imported from Denmark, where most prize hams come from. What most people don't know is that these hams are made from human flesh, and so are these fat girls. In fact, some of the better hams are made from women just like this. Now, I'm not encouraging cannibalism. We have enough fun shooting up, knifing... Uh, performing ritual murders and biting the heads off of small dogs without eating human flesh. Hey, Thelma, Skip says you'd better tell your brother Elvis to stop pissing on the patrons' cars in the Skibby's Mistake parking lot. We've been getting more complaints about this than the beer price increase and the toxic waste containers in the back combined. Shit. This was written... Uh, by a friend of mine and myself. I'm trying to remember which parts were written by me. 
Remember, guys and gals, the police station is right next door, so please shoot up your heroin in the designated areas, in the arcade, behind the jukebox, and of course in the pisser. I mean, that was just too much when Josh and his old lady declared themselves apostles of chopper parts before they slit their wrists to jack-in-the-box. In the news, rumor has it Skip's bringing in a live grizzly bear known as Eat Shit and Puke, You Motherfucker which Skip says will come in around December. The bear will be chained outside near the volleyball area, and, and, and on Jimi Hendrix night, tentatively, tentatively December 3rd, the bear will be injected with LSD before it takes on the Hell's Angels. Bobby Dunn Fuxton took Laura Crewcut from Blessings out last week. We all waited to hear about it, but haven't seen that good old boy lately, although Jimmy Joe says he saw Bobby Dunn walking around aimlessly in a daze, saying over and over, I couldn't believe she had a 10-inch penis. Oh, well. Who is that skeleton with the black hair? She's fresh out of the detention camp and ready for love, but not just any love. This anorexic preppy waitress is holding out for a man with a scaly, reptilian penis with teeth. Skips is like really prep, this fucking pale, buck-toothed, bubble-headed douchebag quips. Like, are you a surfer? She can stick her entire chihuahua-like head up your ass for kicks, Skippy told this reporter while we fired aimlessly at passing cars on Division, where Skippy's mistake is located in Arlington, Texas. Gah! This waitress, whom we will call Marie, says, You know, no, that's like, Gah! This waitress, whom we will call Marie, says, You know, my friend Ratateta and I, because, like, you know, it's prep to let guys do things to your butthole. Are you a surfer? Armed only with her fake ID from Fair Park, these syphilitic storks can be seen on, I'm sorry, this syphilitic stork can be seen on her knees nightly in the stalls in the men's room. Like, it's really prep, you know, it's that dog, <laughs> I can't read the rest of this. Uh, that part wasn't written by me. Okay. So anyway, that offended some people there. Can you believe it? This is an article. My dad helped this guy that um, get his um, medals. Okay, it says, New friend leads charge for a fallen World War II hero. A veteran who died recently may get his medals after all thanks to another old soldier, Grand Prairie. By all accounts, George Roof Jr. was a war hero fighting the Nazis in North Africa under General George Patton and suffering from combat injuries that plagued him until Tuesday the day he died. But through bureaucratic snafus that included destruction of key records two de decades ago, Roof, who was 77, never received any military decoration, not even a Purple Heart for his battle wounds. And yesterday, as Roof's flag-draped coffin was closed and his funeral conducted, a fellow retired serviceman who roomed with Roof during his final hospital stay pledged to carry on the soldiers' fight for recognition. You don't leave your casualties in the battlefield, said retired Army my father, age 66, whose eyes teared as he sat in a pew at First Baptist Church of Grand Prairie moments before Roof's funeral. You go out and get him, and this guy was left. While most of the country observed Veterans Day, my father, wearing his formal blue army tunic and tunic and his own medals to the ceremony, said his friend's inability to receive recognition for two years of combat duty was maddening. I became so furious at how he had been mistreated that I mobilized my staff, uh, my two older brothers, and we started acting as the staff of Mr. Roof, my dad said, adding that in the past 10 days he has written U.S. Representative Martin Frost and Democrat Dallas and various Army officials on the matter. Cindy Crawford, one of Frost's staff members, confirmed receipt of the letter, and the congressman plans to pursue the matter. But Army officials were unavailable for comment because of the Veterans Day observance, although traditionally the holiday is today. Meanwhile, a copy of an official 1946 Army document obtained by Weinert shows that Roof, a technical sergeant assigned a medical unit in the 34th Infantry Division, served in five battles in North Africa and Europe. My father, who retired from the Army in 1976 after 26 years, said anyone with Roof's service record should at least have a half, should have, should have at least half a dozen medals and commendations, including bronze and silver stars, campaign ribbons, and a Purple Heart. George Roof 
the third in Arlington Baker said his father damaged both knees in a 40-foot fall in 1943 during a search for casualties in North Africa. The injuries were treated during the war and Roof returned to service, his son said. But Roof continued to suffer pain and required sp sporadic hospital visits through the years. So my dad met this guy when he was in the hospital and was roommates with him. And Yeah, any time you, sh you shed any blood in combat, you're supposed to get a Purple Heart. During the war, Roof also suffered severe burns on his right arm from white phosphorus, probably from a mortar or artillery shell my father said. Roof made several attempts to obtain service awards but was rebuffed by army bureaucrats and finally gave up, his son said. Complicating matters was a fire in an army storage facility in St. Louis in the 1970s that destroyed some records. Dad was never a man to talk much about the war, said George Roof the third, 49, his voice quavering. He wasn't a complainer. He told us that you play the cards you're dealt. But, but then the elder Roof met my father. They were randomly assigned as roommates at Health South Rehabilitation Hospital of Arlington on October 31st. Roof was recuperating from knee replacement surgery, a consequence of his wartime injury, and my father was recovering from aorta surgery. The two veterans began trading war stories, and soon my father became determined to help his new friend gain his medals. He told me that story and I almost went berserk, my dad said, sitting in a wheelchair in his hospital room where he returned after attending the funeral. I was clawing the ceiling here. George Roof III just said that at, just a few days ago, his father, a devout Baptist, expressed how grateful he was for my father's efforts. He told me to my face that that uh, Gratu's father was heaven sent, the younger Roof said. He said, this is fate. God has brought us together. A couple of days later, George Roof suffered a heart attack and died. His son said he wishes he could have pinned the missing medals on his father's lapel before his coffin was closed for the last time. I think Dad deserves it, he said. So anyway, my father was crusading for that veteran. Uh, this is his, speaking of my father, this is, uh, this is his uh, dad, my grandfather, and that's my uncle, uh, the younger guy there. And so here's another photograph of... Uh, that's my uh, grandfather and my uncle. These are, are pretty good copies of the originals. And uh, so that's him playing for the Chicago Cubs. He played for the Phillies and the Yankees also. And so I need to get these framed because I don't have the originals. These were sent. So let's go in there. Well, anyway, there's theories. There is a. They're saying they're printing all these British flags like a huge. There's an explosion of flag printing in England, so they're thinking that maybe the Queen actually passed away. They haven't told us yet, but they're printing all these flags for her. I don't know. I heard that from somebody. Unconfirmed. <laughs> this is a famous Monsters World Convention in '95. I didn't go to it, but I have the little flyer for it. I will learn not to burn coloring book. I know how to 911 report a fire. I also know how to eat, <laughs> apparently. So. A coloring book you'd give, give to a child that you really hated. Yes, indeed. This is uh, how to play uh, Christmas songs on a piano. Okay, I have a much better copy of this, but this is a Fireball XL5 comic book. This is this one's in junk condition, but I'm not gonna get rid of it. Oh, they used to have these little things. These were little. Uh, they'd send you these in the mail from Lone Star Comics back when it was a brick and mortar store. It's now MyComicShop.com, and it's got like uh, interviews with people. It's their little newsletter. 
It's got a price list back when Beanie Babies were a thing. God damn, that was horrible. Okay, I just need to start throwing this shit into the... Uh, look at look at when I was a greasy junior high school kid. That might have been high school. Look how greasy I was, man. It's just look horrible. A deplorable person. There's later pictures of me. I look like I'm out of my mind in this picture. Okay, this shit goes into the box. Oh. Here's uh, one of my older brothers. He's about to jump out of an airplane. Um, I got a cover. Um, this uh, model. This, uh, I have that radio and, and everything, so I might frame this picture next to that radio. But I can't show you the whole picture because it's offensive. This is on the back of one of those Rat Fink records, a little tiny illustration. I blew it up. A friend of mine had a band called the Oval Teens, and he used that as a t-shirt design. This is drawn by one of my students. I don't know if this is, is this the Elephant Man skeleton? I don't know, man, but I like it, so I save it. <laughs> this is apparently done by one of my students. Um, I guess it's, uh, Mario and it says don't set me on fire okay that's what you get it's called revenge I don't know what is going on there but it's just insane enough that I have to save it oh what is it doing Oh, this, uh, this damn friend of mine, uh, was dating this insane woman, and, uh, back years ago, and she started calling and leaving these long messages on my answering machine, right? Long messages, and this is back, I don't know, in the early days of cell phones, when you talk too long, if you went over a certain amount of time on your cell phone, it charges you a lot of money. And she was she was calling, telling me she was really worried about my friend, that he was acting crazy, and it's like, so I would listen to these messages, and this girl would keep talking for as long, until the message would stop doing. So I'd walk my dog, and I'd be listening to these messages, and they were crazy. But eventually, I guess I listened to them so much that I wound up with a phone bill, like a ridiculously high phone bill. Like like six hundred dollars and I had to talk to the phone company and said hey and they waived it but I, I guess I wrote this up as a report of what was happening to me this crazy woman that wouldn't stop calling I wasn't talking to her I was just listening to her she would leave these long messages and I'd listen to them horrified and I wrote this I'd forgotten about this I've been a good friend of blank for 25 years last year a girl he was going out with began to call me incessantly. Whenever blank was unable to answer his telephone, she would call my cell phone repeatedly, leaving long messages long messages that would completely fill up my voicemail box. Sometimes she would call 20 times in a row at 1 or 2 in the morning. The constant ringing was unnerving and began to affect my, abil my ability to concentrate at work. I called the phone company twice to see if they could block her from calling me, but they did not know how to do it sounds typical. The only suggestion they had was for me to change my number. One phone bill was for $600 and I had to plead with the phone company to cut it in half. Oh, they didn't waive it. Shit. 
Her messages were rambles about concern for blank because he wasn't answering his phone and strange tales that would make you raise both eyebrows. She talked of how she regularly talks with Marilyn Monroe, Andy Warhol, and Rudolph Valentino. She said she was going to marry the founder of the Black Eyed Pea restaurant chain, whom she had known since she was 15, and thus gained the wealth needed to buy up all of the Marilyn Monroe memorabilia on earth and have it destroyed as per the wishes of Marilyn Monroe's ghost. She was also told by Marilyn Monroe that she was to set up a chain of abortion clinics named after Marilyn Monroe because Monroe wanted more people to have abortions. She was also going to buy up all of Andy Warhol's paintings and have them destroyed. <laughs> She, did. She, she talked of her goal of writing Robert E. Lee's autobiography for him. She said that a manager at the Safeway she worked at was the reincarnation of Lee and that she was going to get him to dictate it to her. This girl seemed to really care about blank, but she seemed very scary and unhinged to me. She has currently stopped calling and I'm quite glad and... I'm not really sure why I wrote that, but at least it's wonderful now. It was horrifying at the time. Now reading that, it's quite amusing. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So, throwing stuff in boxes, man. Oh, this is something uh, from my father's headquarters. Six... United States Army, Presidio, San Francisco, California, Memorial. In respect for the late John Fitzgerald Kennedy, President of the United States, there will be a parade of troops on the main parade ground, Presidio, San Francisco, California, at 1,000 hours, Saturday, 23rd, November 1963. A one-gun salute will be fired every half hour, beginning at Reveille and ending at Retreat. And this comes with it, so this must be the actual... Uh, um, ceremony for Kennedy. So that's that. There's a photograph of a witch. In reality they all look like Hillary Clinton. They don't really look like that in real life. This is a an old uh, friend of mine. Does, uh, I met him through my friend Randy. This is, uh, he was an artist, is an artist. This is the stuff he was selling back then in the 90s. He had this, uh, did I buy one of those? No, I didn't. He had a portrait of Ed Gein, a, a hand printed wood cut. I bought one of those and I gave it to this girl. Uh, so I don't have that, but I do have, uh, I have a, a drawing, a painting of a clown firing a machine gun by him, and I have, uh, I have several illustrations um, by, the, it's uh, Charles Hancock. Yeah, he's great. Why is the Star Telegram saved from 1995? What is the reason? Oh, it's the it's that article that I read about how my father was helping that guy get his medals. It's actually on it was on the front cover. This is the original newspaper, so I got to say that to show that my father was a nice guy. For anyone that has any doubt. More of my father's stuff. Okay. That's my, uh, I guess my dad's getting promoted, my mom and somebody, or I don't know what he's getting promoted to. Okay, cool. Some people just throw shit like this away when they're moving. Eh, who needs these old pictures? I'm gonna take my old parents' yearbooks down to half price books and sell them. Maybe I can get enough money to get a burrito at Taco Bell, man. Bicentennial America. Uh, old
old photographs. Yes, indeed. It's my brother Steve, the one that had all the cool uh, army men. That goes in there. He's passed away. Unfortunately. Picture of a bunch of army guys. Section 7, Class 65-2, Command and General Staff College, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. That's the way that I always will remember my brother, my oldest brother, Steve. Probably high school graduation. This is a picture of Jesus. That's how he actually looked. Don't listen to anyone else. This is a picture of my mother. High school graduation, possibly college, I don't know. Needs to be framed. Those are original pictures. <sighs> Empty envelope. That's always nice. Okay, motherfuckers. Oh, the three branches of government. I used to have this up. Uh, I had a class of social studies. Well, mostly I was an English teacher for like one or two years. So this is the this represents the executive, right? I painted these really quickly. This represents the judicial, all right? These are Supreme Court idiots. And this is the legislative branch, right? Look at that one guy there. It looks like a caveman. It's like Animal from uh, The Muppet Show, right? Amazing artwork. Why it's uh, what was her name? Psylocke. New special added short subjects. Students getting a Dr. Pepper from a, a machine that used to be around the time I was born at the school I used to teach at. What are these? Why it's it's my grandfather. It's a photo of Connie Francis. I don't know why it's not framed. Golden Girl comes to Hollywood. Connie Francis, the nation's top feminine recording star, was lured away from her platter recording sessions long enough to make her Bow in Hollywood films, appearing in a major role in the Joe Pasternak production for Metro Goldwyn Mayer, Where the Boys Are. Also headlining uh, in the film are Dolores Hart, George Hamilton, Yvette Mimo, George, Jim Hutton, and Paula Prentice. Whatever happened to that actor? In the 80s, he was pretty big. Uh, Jim Hutton had a son. I forget what his. Was it Tim, Tim or Tom? Tim Hutton or something? Did he die or something? Because I remember there was a movie called Taps with George C. Scott, and there was Jim Hutton's son, and I think Tom Cruise, that's where he first became uh, big in that movie. And then he was in All the Right Moves, uh, I think. This is a picture I got from eBay. It's the 1931 Yankees. That's the year that my grandfather played for them so I thought maybe my grandfather's in there somewhere but but when I got this my father had already passed away so he probably could have identified which one of these is my grandfather he played for the Yankees for one year I assume he's in the picture he may not be I don't know okay so I got this uh, when I was in third fourth grade from the ice station near me um, in San Antonio. 
and so it'll be on display in the new house. But I didn't know any better that it's going to be collectible, so I put the little sticker there where the price is normally written, and then further down, I put another one of those little stickers there. But I don't know, it gives it character. And this is what came in it, these little boxes that have candy and two prizes. But the prizes were not Planet of the Apes related, I don't think. Um, so, you know, I bought the rest of what was in the box. He said, if I buy all of these, can I keep the box? And the guy said, uh, yeah. So that's what that is. How about that one? Oh my God. Well, fucking time is it? The sun's up. I started at like 5 in the morning. I may end this episode and uh, come back later. And, uh, or I may not. Be seeing you.